Okay, so here's one for you. During a college Halloween party, a notoriously unsociable future Hall of Fame rocker uh, subtly hit on the married and pregnant wife of one of his professors. I guess he slipped her his phone number. Uh, the question is, did she call him? Did it escalate to a torrid affair? Actually, the advance did not lead to a scandal, but it did trigger the creation of one of classic rock's biggest hits. We're going to tell you all about it, and we'll get the inside scoop from one of the former members of this band, one of the original members, who crushed the song's guitar solo. The interview and story is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember the utter joy of buying your favorite artist's new 45 or cassette single or even maxi single, depending on what generation you're from, you're going to love this channel. Mega music nostalgia all the time. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the bell so that you know when our new interviews come out. And we also have a Patreon there. Your support helps us so much when we give you more content for it. So Walter Becker and Donald Fagan forged their friendship and musical partnership when they met in the late 60s while attending Bard College, a private liberal arts school located in Annandale on Hudson, New York. Uh, so much happened while the two were students at Bard. Becker and Fagan, they were in a band called Leather Canary with a the then unknown Chevy Chase on drums. They were also arrested during a marijuana bus as part of a campus-wide war on long hairs waged by uh, local sheriff's deputies. And Fagan met an intriguing woman at a Halloween party at Bard College named Ricky. Now, that influenced the writing of the duo's biggest pop hit ever, Ricky Don't Lose That Number. Ricky don't lose that number. You don't wanna call nobody. Her full name is Ricky Ducournay. She was the wife of Guy Ducournay, who happened to be one of Fagan's professors at Bard. As both Fagan and Ducournay tell it, there was obvious chemistry between the two of them when they met at the party, which was full of fellow college students. Now, Ricky was married and at that time pregnant uh, during the encounter, but that didn't stop Donald Fagan from not only engaging in conversation with Ricky, he was undaunted by her husband's stature at the college. Hoping he would uh, become more than just an acquaintance, Donald slipped Ricky his phone number. Ricky don't lose that number. It's the only now, Ricky found Donald Fagan very interesting. And although she came really close, she fought off the temptation and never called the future Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. Fagan turned Ricky's spurning into the impetus for writing Ricky Don't Lose That Number, even though Fagan's lyrics don't really refer to that particular meeting at the Halloween party. We could stay inside and play games, I don't know. Before the encounter with Ricky Ducournay was revealed, rumors flew about the meaning of the song, what it was about. There was widespread speculation that the song was actually an ode to Ricky Lee Jones. Chucky. Also, some said it was maybe about Donald's high school friend, Ricky Truitt, who spelled Ricky the exact same way that Mrs. Ducournay spelled it. There's also speculation that the words heard in the first verse, that it was about uh, trying to talk Rick Derringer uh, out of leaving the group. Like the lyrics, we hear you're leaving, that's okay. I thought our little wild time had just begun. I thought our little wild time had just begun. I guess you kind of scared yourself, you turn and run. But if you have a change of heart. But if you have a change of heart. Now, Rick Derringer jammed around a bit in the early days with Steely Dan. He was one of the first to deliver the guitar solo for Reeling in the Years. But after Rick finished and left the studio, Walter Becker told engineer Elliot Shiner to erase the tape. Elliot Randall eventually took his turn at the solo and he gave him exactly what Becker and Fagan wanted in just one take, one of the best solos ever. Fagan has been really vague on exactly when he wrote Ricky Don't Lose That Number. We're not sure if his thoughts went immediately to paper while waiting for Ricky's call, but Donald Fagan didn't present the song to Walter Becker until 1973, according to record. 
to discuss it for Seely Dan's third studio LP, Pretzel Logic. For the recording of Ricky Don't Lose That Number and the rest of the material on Pretzel Logic, Steely Dan hired LA's finest session musicians. Jim Gordon and Jeff Percaro. They replaced Steely Dan original member Jim Hodder on drums. The exquisite piano on Ricky Don't Lose That Number. So great. Those were performed by three-time Grammy Award winner Michael Martian, who is an amazing multi-instrumentalist as well as an incredible producer. Besides Steely Dan, Omartian played on tracks recorded by the Four Tops, Johnny Rivers, Sills and Crofts, uh, Loggins and Messina, and Al Jarreau. In 1973, he actually played the accordion on Billy Joel's signature Piano Man. Omartian was the founding member of the disco funk band Rhythm Heritage, who went to number one with their theme song from the TV show SWAT. Actually, in 1985, O'Martin arranged and played the keyboards on the massive number one charity single, We Are the World, uh, by the supergroup USA for Africa. Now, the background vocals on Ricky Don't Lose That Number, those were sung by Timothy B. Schmidt. This was why he was still a member of, uh, of a Poco, four years before he joined the Eagles, replacing Randy Meisner. He don't lose that number. Now, for the enhanced guitar work on Pretzel Logic, Steely Dan enlisted Jeff Skunk Baxter, who has provided some of the greatest guitar solos and timeless musicianship of the entire rock era. And actually, I spoke with Skunk about what he experienced while working with Steely Dan. He was original member of the band very early on. Also, how he came up with that inspiring solo on Ricky Don't Lose That Number. And here's what he said about that and Steely Dan. Now, as we go into this segment, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I always wear. Make sure that you go to zenny.com and design your own eyewear. Your color, your favorite shape for your face, and uh, your own style. They start at only $6.95. Check it out today. You're skunk. You might use it if you feel better. Pretzel Logic in 74, I mean, that's one that you'd have to remember a little bit more because of that incredible solo on Ricky Don't Lose That Number. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you. What did you think when you first heard the song? And tell me about the process of putting that together. I'm really trying to, you know, think back, you know, trying to imagine the coffee on the console. Uh, I, it, it was just one more, one more piece of music we... we I don't think we had any expectations other than trying to do a better than credible job and create something. Uh, the solo on that, that was something that I had thought out a little bit because I, I did believe that, or still do, that a good solo is really a composition in and of itself. So in the same way as... Probably my old school was a little more going at it. Just, you know, getting in the driver's seat, turning on the key and, you know, heading down the road. I had really thought about the solo in uh, Ricky because I wanted to see if I could grab two or three different Genre is the wrong word, but two or three different points of view. Some of it was bluesy. Some of it had a little bit of a jazz feel. Some of it had, uh, fusion is the wrong word, but looking at chords that were outside of what the chords were in the song specifically and laying them over and trying to create a, a bit of a, uh, some harmonic depth, I guess. You certainly did. It's such an interesting song because it's like, it's like tango-like, you know, it's like a tango. <laughs> in yeah. And we, uh, uh, we did uh, borrow, I guess is a nice word, 
the intro from Horace Silver <laughs> on that. But uh, I, I think that since we stand on the shoulders of, of giants, that, you know, I, I don't think that was a necessarily a bad thing. One of the things that strikes me about it is it doesn't come up to you and hit you across the face. Right. It asks you, it says, check this out. You know, here's something as opposed to, all right, you know, right. It, it, it draws you in and, and is friendly. It's not unfriendly. A lot of music, especially music that is not mainstream sometimes is musically uh, unfriendly because it's difficult for the listener to find a portal to get into it. It's very friendly. The tempo is very friendly. The feel is very friendly. And as you say, it is kind of a tango. It's a, it's a, it's a song that begins to move your body before it begins to move your mind. Mm -hmm. I like that. And that is rare is the wrong word, but it's not typical. You don't want to call nobody else. And I think that's why it became, I, from what I gather, was pretty much Steely Dan's uh, biggest hit. Because it had this combination of beguiling, comfort, and depth. And I, I, I'm not trying to sound like we're the smartest guys in the world. I'm not sure we, none of any of us knew what we were doing. You couldn't tell. It had that, it had the right combination. The solo also is, is understated and it does the same thing. It kind of draws you in. And as soon as it draws you in and it's over, it sets up that last part for Donald to come in and really hit with that last chorus. I feel like if it's a song that's, that's going to last, is it it keeps you kind of on the edge of your seat and you want to continue to listen. Yeah, again, I think there's a beguiling. Is there such a thing as a beguilement factor uh, what, <laughs> or something about that? And the idea, as I thought about it, because I did, again, I gave it some forethought to open up into the next set of chord changes, which were had not appeared in the song before. And I think it's important if to, to, to make people comfortable so that when they say, well, where's, they don't go, where's the hook? What happened? It's oh, okay. I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty full uh, dessert <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or something, you know, something different. I uh, to set it up correctly. Ricky Don't Lose That Number was near completion when Fagan and Becker decided they needed an additional element that would add a unique dimension to the song, you know, to get that extra lacquer of jazz. Steely Dan decided to bring in percussionist Victor Feldman, who had executed the gripping conga section on Do It Again. Fagan and Becker wanted Feldman to jazz it up, as they said, so he used a flampamba to produce a distinctive tone for Ricky's intro. Now, flampamba, for those who don't know, is essentially a tricked out marimba with altered wood bars that generate different pitches and tones. The flampamba parts, they elicit a really interesting contrast to the elegance of the, the piano line. Actually, Feldman's intro on Ricky is nearly identical to Song for My Father, a jazz standard by the trailblazing Horace Silver, who started the hard bop movement of American jazz in the 50s. Fagan doesn't debate the similarities to Silver's most famous work, stating there was never a conscious thought about stealing Silver's intro. He actually views it as more of a homage than, than a poaching. <laughs> Years after that seemingly incidental Halloween party at Bard College, 
Donald Fagan and his Foxhole partner, Walter Becker, turned Steely Dan into one of the world's most distinctive rock bands. I mean, they just, they stand alone as the standard bearers of jazz and rock convergence. Ricky Ducournay also achieved preeminence as a writer, poet, and artist. As the author of eight novels, five books of poetry, and the creator of many internationally acclaimed paintings, Ricky has become one of the most important surrealist artists in the world. And what does Ricky think of the song that was inspired by that chance encounter back in the 60s? She says she finds this song interesting. There's actually a passage in Ricky Don't Lose That Number that Ricky believes was a very perceptive observation that was pointed out by her rock and roll admirer. In the song's bridge, Fagan sings out in his you know, wry, idiosyncratic vocal style. You tell yourself you're not my kind. But you don't even know your mind. But you don't even know your mind. And you could have a change of heart. And you could have a change of heart. That lyric was a jolt of self-realization for Ricky. During that period of her life, when she met Fagan, she admits to sometimes feeling really lost and was losing her way. The expression, don't lose that number, was another way of telling someone to not lose themselves. That's a great example of the depth behind Donald Fagan's songwriting, how intellectually stimulating it can be. In addition to his cerebral merit, Ricky Don't Lose That Number was simply an irresistible pop smash. Speaking of which, I love how Cameron Crowe used it in the 1989 film, Say Anything. Ricky don't lose that number. I always wondered if Ricky Don't Lose That Number had any kind of influence on Phil Collins and his 85 hit, Billy Don't Lose My Number. Of course, it's not called that. It's simply Don't Lose My Number, but it says Billy in it all the time. It's pretty close. Ricky and Billy. Oh. Also, earlier, I'd said that there was a rumor that Ricky Don't Lose That Number was about Ricky Lee Jones, which has been proven false, but actually Bruce Springsteen apparently wrote the song, Ricky Wants a Man of Her Own, about Ricky Lee Jones. Ricky wants a man of her own. The track is the highest charting single for Steely Dan. It climbed to number four on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1974. It actually rose even higher in Canada. It peaked at number three. The single might as well have been a total bust as far as Becker and Fagan were concerned. Those cranky, eminent hipsters <laughs> were never fond of this song. And they've actually left it off their set list for their live concerts for many years. After you hear the evolution of Ricky Don't Lose That Number, I can't help but wonder, what would have happened if Ricky didn't fend off that temptation and did call Donald Fagan? I mean, there's no question that she was enchanted by Donald Fagan and his music. But she knew that making a phone call would be far too risky for a married woman, you know, with a child on the way, no less. Ricky didn't lose that number. She just didn't dial it. Leave us a comment about Steely Dan and this classic slice of, of 70s jazz rock. What are your memories of the song? What are your thoughts on the imminent hipsters? Donald and Walter, what are your thoughts on their amazing catalog? Uh, we lost Walter a few years back. He's an incredible musician. I still don't make him like that anymore. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below. Be a part of our daily videos so that you know when, when they drop. We really appreciate your support. Um, help us to, to keep the music alive. That's kind of the idea here. Till next time, three chords. Hand the truth.